This is Broad Radio. For you, by you. Broad Radio. Here for more. Hello, 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 and welcome to Broad Radio. I'm Jo Stanley, and my co-host today, I'm thrilled to welcome her to the, for the first time to Broad Radio, Mimi Kwa, author, TV presenter, MC, speaker. I mean, what don't you do? Thank you, Jo Stanley. I'm just delighted to be here, and, and up until now, I haven't done Broad Radio, so oh. now I can add this to my list. Thank I, you. I love it. <laughs> um, you are the author of a book that I have just finished, House of Kwa. Look at me holding it up like an amateur. Oh, you finished it. I just... Yes. Oh my! <laughs> you say that with such surprise. I know. Well, I just know how busy you are, and so the fact that you've invested that time into reading and completing my book. Thank you. I absolutely really loved it. So it wasn't a chore at all. Uh, however, you are right. I'm very busy. Um, but <laughs> what, to be able to read, you'd be the same. You have four children. I only have one. But uh, it just means I have to say to my husband, no, tonight we'll not be catching up on White Lotus. I'm going to be reading. So it's just discipline, really. It is discipline. Thank you, Joe. I do know that some people have had to lock themselves in a cupboard in order to get through the book that they're reading at the moment. It's so true. It's hard to set aside time mm. for reading. We're going to talk about all of that, how we ingest our literature. That's one thing we might go down. And also I want to ask you so much about your book, House of Kwa. Um, we'll do that in a little while. We also have later on in the show joining us Dr Lillian Najard, who is a clinical psychologist and has created an app called Contain Your Brain, which guides us through what's known as worry time. This is very exciting because we all have our worries and this idea of worry time, I'm sorry, but I did think of MC Hammer for those of, those of us who are older. <laughs> Stop. Worry it's time. Worry time. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, but it's amazing. I've done a lot of therapy, Mimi. I guess maybe you have also. I'm hearing you. Yes, yep. but I've never heard of this particular strategy and I'm here for it. So we're looking forward to uh, hearing that all about that from Dr Lillian Najard a little later on as well but first we have to get straight into our first guest because she's super busy I will say I had your book um, Mimi in bed with me I've had this next guest's book in my kitchen so very intimate with these people um, it's a beautiful book it's called The Joy of Better Cooking it's now an award winning cookbook and it's by the amazing foodie broadcaster brilliant uh, and uh, very good power walker I would say Alice Zaslavsky Hello, Alice. <laughs> Hello, Joe. Hello, Mimi. I'm so thrilled to be with you this morning, uh, and I can't wait to get my hands on House of Choir as well. Yes. Now, oh, I'm just going to check that our audio is okay over there with you, Triana, yeah. our beautiful broadcasting producer there, because the audio is very strange from my end. Speak to me again, Alice. Sure. Okay. Can you hear me now? What's that happening? Yeah. It's, it's all so good. It was all good, but now it's coming in only on one side of my brain which is, is so my annoying <laughs> okay am i gonna have to call in the big gun oh you see. might need i'll to see if i can do the settings yeah uh, but on. yeah i might have to oh, i don't know that what's happening there that's a shame because i know we're tight okay. for time um yeah. no no so. we'll, we'll do we'll do our best but i'll, I'll go mm. and i'll call the i'll call the man the legend will we keep it. going and push on or <laughs> will think... we mm, no you, well i feel like because otherwise we're not going to be able to use this conversation for our 
our um, podcast as well. So I'm just going to say, whilst we wait for the big guns, which is actually Alice's partner, Nick, who seems to run I could, the I could be your stuff. backup author. Yes, you will be in a moment. But I'm just going to oh. mention that um, if you are watching live, we would love it if you joined us with comments and any questions along the way. That's via Facebook or YouTube. And, of course, you can catch up on all of our previous episodes via podcast with our podcast, Broad Radio On The Go. Let's see uh, whether Alice is there and what she sounds like. I'm all good. I have to say, though, because um, our three-and-a-half-year-old came in before and swung me around on the chair and the whole scarlet dropped. So it may be that she's... Is it all kosher? Yeah. Okay. No? I don't know. I don't, I don't, know. I don't know why it's yeah. suddenly I sounding think we'll push weird. on. I think we'll okay. push on. Sure. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise we'll be <laughs> wasting all our time trying to fix a plug. <laughs> yeah. And three and a half year olds will do that. They will do that. They love the chaos. Um, yeah. And we love we love it too. Yeah, yeah so absolutely. Um, yeah, um, Alice, congrats on your book. I really love <laughs> it. You. It's called The Joy of Better Cooking. And the premise is anyone can be a better cook. I like that because I'm never going to be a great cook, but I'd like to be a better one. I think everyone just kind of needs to get that out of their heads that they need to be a good cook. That's something that is so binary and so limiting. Uh, and it says that, uh, you know, I think we've got enough areas in our lives where we need to set uh, limit, where, where we already kind of try and aspire to something. I feel like in the kitchen, uh, just if you aspire to be in there as often as possible, you're just going to get better naturally. So it's about flying hours. Is that doing the dishwasher or <laughs> other chores in the kitchen or just being in the kitchen with the potential ingredients that could potentially go into a potentially fantastic dish? That will potentially be appreciated. <laughs> all of the above. But as far as I'm concerned, if you're doing the cooking, someone else should be doing the cleaning. So uh, in our household, um, my husband does all of the washing up. Uh, in fact, he does all the cleaning because I make all the mess. So <laughs> I think it's a great yin and yang there. <laughs> I like your use of the word potential there, Mimi, because it, it implies that there's always growth. There's always um, kindness. Because I, I have to say when I cook, and, and I'm not great, um, and, but I'm there a lot, uh, and I always have grand goals for what I'm creating. And when it falls short, sometimes I'm very, I'm very mean to myself. I think there has to be forgiveness. We there is, and, and I, I really think that as women, we do kind of um, try and aim for perfection too much. And we kind of say, you know, what's the goal? What sort of... Um, kind of what's the picture and what am I aspiring to? But I have to say, when I cook the dishes out of this book, they don't look like the pictures in the book because I don't have a professional photography team. I don't have a professional stylist. I don't have a professional food team that puts all of that together and perfect lighting. So just kind of what I'm saying is do less, set less expectations on yourself and just have fun with it. Play, be free, because what you'll find is that over time you'll naturally get better and it will naturally start to look more and more not like the picture, but more and more like what you imagined in your own mind. Mm. I l have learnt a few things from your cookbook, which I've this week alone I've cooked three dishes from your cookbook, and um, I will admit did not look like the pictures. <laughs> but what did you make? I made the meatballs last night, delicious, the meatball soup, um, mm. and I made the taco bowl, taco rice. And there was another one with the broccolis on top and I was oh, the yeah. cheesy, crusty yeah. broccoli yeah. on top. Yeah, oh, delicious. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, two <laughs> things I've learned, though. A, oh, my gosh, I have never cooked my mince, to really get very granular here, I've never cooked my mince the way you told us to cook it, which was basically you just take it, like you've squished it up in the packet and then you take it out as it all is and then you just put it on the fry pan like that and then you flip it over the other side and then it's cooked and then you just... Oh. Separate it. Oh, like a giant. That's that amazing. So, I know. You're just mushing it. So when you oh, when you think about what mince last night, not like that. Wow. <laughs> Good. I'm glad that we're kind of we're all moving further on the continuum because it is. That's what it is. So um, this is I the evolution of cooking. 
Exactly. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons why I love it, because I'm always evolving as well. And that's actually a tip that I picked up from uh, an Australian Italian chef called Giovanni Pilou. And um, he made that for his bolognese. And I thought, oh, that's a really great idea of making a giant patty and letting it caramelize on one side and then mm. mash, 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 and then letting it caramelize on the other. So uh, I, I think it's a great way of keeping your mince from looking like brown worms, uh, <laughs> even just mushing it in the, in the little packet so that it uh, stops having the squiggles. If you think about the way that mince is actually uh, processed and you cook it that way, you keep it in these little sausage-like squiggly worms and texturally it just doesn't feel like a good experience. So if you cook it as one big patty and then you mash it, you just get a better mouthfeel, which really, mm. if you break cooking down to take the pressure off yourself, you're trying to create something that feels good as you're eating it and feels good in your tummy. And I guess actually feels good as you're cooking it too, which, which is what the joy of better cooking is about. I'm trying to make the experience of cooking an enjoyable one rather than forcing you to set unrealistic expectations on yourself. There is something though about an aesthetically good looking meal. So whilst you're saying we don't, we shouldn't put too much emphasis on making our meals look like the photoshopped, well lit, you know, photography shoot meal that we might see in the pages of your book, what can we do just to make things look that little bit prettier? Like, for example, I'll go out to my herb garden and even if I've got a little bit of a, I hate to say it, dog's breakfast that I've created <laughs> of a meal, I find that if I pick some fresh herbs and sprinkle them on the top, mm. that can sort of salvage the aesthetic for everybody. Herbs are like the jewellery of the food world. So even if your outfit is pretty plain, if you just add some herbs on top, as you say, it's the garnish. It just really lifts a dish and it creates texture. So the best thing to think about when you're thinking about the aesthetic of a dish is colour. Because actually we do eat with our eyes and research is showing that it's the bioactives in each of those different uh, coloured vegetables and fruits and parts of our diet that help us to feel great but also help signify to our bodies that we're about to ingest something really nutritious and really exciting. So think about adding colour to your plate. Herbs are fantastic because green is just such a, a lifting, calming, energising uh, colour. So yes, grow some herbs. We've finally, and this is like three years after planting, we've finally got some dill and some coriander and I'm adding it to everything together. I wouldn't normally put dill and coriander together, but it's working for me at the moment. And it's amazing how you can have something really flat and just add some herbs on top. Great. Christmas, buy yourself some herbs or grow them better, better yet. Some nuts are also great. So if you've got some walnuts or some hazelnuts or some almonds just chopped up and sort of tossed over the top, otolenghi style, that can lift a dish as well. If you want to go to the next level, fry them in butter. Mm. Buttered nuts mm. on anything. Delicious. Oh my God. Everything's better in <laughs> butter. Everything's better in butter. But, but everything. if you're plant based, then you could do the same with olive oil. So just fry your nuts in olive oil, and then you've not only got these toasty, lovely nuts, but you've also got this nut infused oil that you can drizzle over the top. Mm. And a good finishing oil is really useful. So you'll see that on dishes that they always look quite glossy and, and lush on a page. It's because they've been oiled like a body, you know? So uh, like, a, like a body on the stage at a bodybuilding contest, think about oiling up your dish. That's what the finishing. Uh, oil is for. I've got an olive oil that I just use for finishing which is sort of a bit more lush but just any sort of fruity olive oil that you kind of just gloss the, the plate with right at the end or the platter can really make that difference. And then a few cheeks of lemon or lime to lift it, you know, in case people want something a bit more acidic, you can have those cheeks and squirt those over the top of the dish as well. Mm, how so you've got um, yellow, you've got, you got oh, green, you've got, I'm you know. Salivating I'm salivating as we hear I'm this. doing the thing. There we go. <laughs> See, it's, not, it's, it's not hard. It's not hard. You I'm, just have to kind of, yeah, yeah have the jewellery. Alice, I, I have to tell you that I have never felt more seen than when I read the introduction to your beautiful book uh, in which you acknowledge that learning to cook sort of comes in stages and often it starts with hanging out with our grandmothers and, and then we go through our life stages. Um, and then you said, what happens if, if you miss a stage or three? Which for me made me really emotional because my family were not the kind of family where we cooked together. And I've always felt really envious of that. I've always felt kind of sad that I didn't have that 
I mean, you know, I joke about it. We don't have that food tradition. You know, for us, it was tuna casserole. That was it, right? So there's no cultural tradition. But also there were big gaps in our family as far as that was concerned because we had a lot of trauma and we just weren't a family that gathered together in a kitchen. And so I felt really kind of like, oh, that's so true that so many of us don't know how to cook because we just didn't have that that kind of warm you know, development of our relationship with food. Um, But it reminded me also how the food we eat is a documentation of our lives, which is just, it's just a beautiful, you know, you really nailed it in your book. Thank you. Thank you, Jo. And I I really, um, I truly believe that one of the unfortunate kind of aspects of foodie culture is that it has made some people feel like they don't belong in that conversation. So I really wanted to create like a permission slip to say you can be here, you belong here, and it's time for you to rewrite your own family story. Just because you didn't have that, you know, violins uh, crescendo of cooking at your nonna's, you know, apron strings, it doesn't mean that you can't in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, 80s start cooking for yourself and and for your family and just for the people that you love and most importantly for the person that you should love the most which is for you yes cook for yourself first actually you've just inspired me and made me think about the fact that um i can because i really believe when you have children that's your healing right for what you may have missed when you were growing up um and you've just made me go you know what i have to re think the way I talk about cooking with my daughter because I don't love cooking but I need to stay, change that language and maybe create for her now those memories mm, that I absolutely. didn't have. Absolutely because I often say I'm not a good cook and I'll say that to my children or in front of my children if I'm talking to a friend because my husband does most or that could translate to all of the <laughs> cooking at home but I'm just reinforcing a negative message to myself but also to my children who I'm sure would you know benefit from me pottering around on more than just the thermomix in the kitchen. <laughs> exactly. And I really am so glad that we can have this conversation and it's about language and it's about kind of being careful because careful the things you say. You know, children are always listening and you don't want them in 30 years time to say, "Oh, my mum was a terrible cook." which actually is not true at all, you know, Mm. because it's kind of like saying my mum's a terrible breather. We can all cook. (laughs) (laughs) We can get better at breathing and we can get better at cooking, but it's a natural instinct. So it's actually about uh, giving your children permission to know that it's a place where everybody can enjoy themselves because um, the best thing you can do actually for your kids is get them involved. It's actually the best thing you can do for yourself as well because over time they will be the ones that are the most helpful and then all those tedious jobs that you don't really enjoy, they can do for you. You know, mm. I get Hazel on to the, she's three and a half. I get her potting broad beans and, you know, mashing up. We've got some tuna for breakfast. So she was mashing the tuna and, you know, putting, putting the, that's uh, from the book as well, actually. That's, I think of, uh, you know, the, the chicken of the sea um, sandwich. We've just made like a salad with it. And she, and she said, why don't we put some, this is so bougie. She's like, we could put this in, which is cornichons. Uh, so <laughs> sliced up some cornichons, but like you just put some pickles in. I love that she's already experimenting. And I think that's because she sees that sometimes I add something and it works. And sometimes I add something and it doesn't. And it's a very kind of conversational way in which we deal with it. It's not confrontational. And if you are thinking to yourself, I'm not a good cook because I'm worried about how my family is going to receive the food, set yourself up to win. Put things on the table where the onus is on them to make the food taste the way they want it to taste. Mm. So salt flakes, cracked pepper. I mentioned the oil. Put a little bottle of olive oil on the on the table so that they can finish it for themselves. All of those kind of little things. Even garlic powder. Just some really nice, um, simple, um, it's called Simple Organics, green lid. I've always got that on my table. And I just sprinkle, if I feel like the dish is la- lacking depth, I sprinkle a bit of garlic powder and suddenly it tastes better. Then then the onus is on them to make the food taste as good as they want it to. All of our taste buds are different. And if it's still not good enough for them, then they can get into the kitchen and cook it for themselves. I love that. Such great tips. Like the onus is on them to make Mm. it taste the way they... I love it. It's amazing, Alice. I know that you've got a very tight schedule, so I'm going to let you go, but I did want to share with you that one of our... Um, listeners today, Michelle says, oh my God, Alice helped me love vegetables for the first time in my life. That's of course because your previous cookbook was In Praise of Veg. 
Well, that's I'm so glad, Michelle, that you say that because I think that I, I like to set myself some some goals of my own. And with In Praise of Veg, it really was about shifting people's understanding and language around veg. So this is doing that, but on a broader scale about cooking in general and food in general. So, you know, really um, the way that I figured out what I wanted to say in this book is that I did one-to-one -one interviews with people just like you. I said, you know, I tried to find friends of friends who didn't know me and said that they were bad cooks or hated cooking. And then I tried to solve their problems. So whether they were worried about burning stuff or worried about uh, <laughs> poisoning their families or they just felt like they didn't belong there because they never got into the kitchen as a kid. I spoke to a man who said, well, I grew up in a Greek household and whenever I tried to go in the kitchen, my grandmother would say to me, that's not where men go. So he's now in his 30s and he's learning to love cooking again or learning to love cooking from scratch. So I want everybody to know that the kitchen is a place where everyone belongs and no matter where you are in your cooking journey, every time you step into it, you get better. And that is the joy. Mm, that's such a beautiful message it. because it's really, it's around enoughness, isn't it? I can be enough in the kitchen. Enoughness in your life. I think that ki the kitchen is also a real place of therapy. So if you learn to be uh, more empathetic with yourself and learn that, that enoughness in the kitchen, then that can really broaden out into the rest of your life as well. Amazing. Alice, thank you so much for joining us, for squeezing us into your very busy morning. And thank you for your cookbook. I've referred to it so, so much this week and I know it will continue. Oh, thank you, Joe. And Mimi, I'm going to send you a copy and I can't wait to hear oh, how your whole family you. just start cooking together. It's just wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Beautiful. I love yeah. that. Thanks, Alice. Yeah. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, Mimi, I was just listening to Alice speak there about, it's like she gives so much of herself in her food knowledge and in her philosophy around food, right? And it just occurred to me that in a lot of ways, that's memoir telling for her. Mm. And you yourself have written a memoir. I have. Did you like that segue? I love the segue. <laughs> I actually wanted to speak more about Alice's book, but very happy to segue. Oh, no, into let's, let's try. You, I, welcome to get your reflections yeah, on Alice's book. Well, I just thought, I mean, that it is memoir, even writing a cookbook. And I was very interested in how somebody, you know, because Ottolenghi and Nigella endorse Alice's book, which amazing, very well-known um, cooks, chefs, um, food makers. And I thought, wow, I wonder how that works in that um, in the food writing industry when you're reviewing somebody else's book. Like, do you go in and make some of the recipes? Do Is it because you know the person? Mm. Are you reading it from sort of a memoir perspective? And I thought that's really interesting because, of course, you know, when somebody reviews a novel or a memoir or a nonfiction book, they read the book. So yes, what do yeah. you do when you're reviewing a food book? But if you're Nigella or Otolenghi, Surely they can read a recipe and go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They Ingredients, just get it. Yep. Yeah. method, yep, that's going to work. Mm. Or those flavours, mm, why would you do that? Yeah. You know, may <laughs> maybe they... I feel like they're not going to write <laughs> some the blurb on someone's book. Mm. No, but I mean, it's I like, I guess it's like a musician reading a score, yeah. right? Yes. I wonder if they don't... I feel like maybe they it's don't need to... It's a language unto itself. Yeah. So mm. they're praising um, or, you know, recommending the recipes because I can see what Alice has put together. But also, like I say, that cookbook, so much of it is about kindness and really acceptance and the enoughness that you mm. talked about. So it brings so much more than just a cookbook, right, mm. of which I have thousands. Mm. And again, I'm not going to say I'm a bad cook because I'm changing my language, but I'm a getting better cook. <laughs> but this is a bit, her book's about it. It's like a, it's about a psychology mm. of cooking. I mean, I felt like crying even at the beginning of the chat with her because I thought that's just so true that having the confidence to step into the kitchen, particularly when you've got a partner who traditionally in the relationship, my husband and I have been together for 30 years. And I think I do have this subliminal and overt messaging for myself that I am not the cook in the relationship. I'm not a good cook. And the more you say anything, the more you manifest it and the more you gravitate towards that. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, you are a memoir writer, though. Yeah, I can, actually... I can make dumplings. Yeah. <laughs> can you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
because that, I guess that was one of my my, my, my first know, questions. If I yeah, if I was going to, and I do love a segue, and I love sort of connecting conversations. Mm. And your memoir is about obviously you and your family. Um, you begin well. Firstly, you begin by dropping this revelation that you are being sued by your father. Right. Yeah. Incredible start to a book, but then you transport us way back to China. Yeah, then you have to wait a long time to find out. Why. It's clever. <laughs> There's a tease. <laughs> no, but you take us way back to 1884 in China, um, where your descendants are basically. Mm. Um, and it's interesting to me when you're writing a story and you're thinking about your own story. Do you feel connected to that? that version of your family? Because if I were to think of my version of over 100 years ago of my family, I don't feel like I'm connected to that. I do feel very connected to that version of my family, I think, because growing up in Australia as a Eurasian person um, of Chinese and also British descent, <clears throat> pardon me, I, I guess I was the coloniser and the colonised and I was trying to, obviously that sophisticated language that I have now to use, but when I was a little girl growing up feeling very different and feeling ostracised at times, definitely feeling remote and, and um, from what I perceive were other people's white Australian experiences, I really spent a lot of my life, now that I can you know, look back with hindsight, I spent a lot of my life trying to find my identity. and in discovering who I am, which is actually not my um, you know, physical form like or cultural identity at all, but to get there, I really did connect very strongly with my cultural identity because I wanted to know where I belonged. And that helped me um, discover a lot about myself by, I think for any of us exploring our family heritage, it's a, it's a fantastically, um, healing, restorative exercise to go through, and no wonder sites like Ancestry.com and you know, and um, doing a DNA test and all of those things are so popular because people really want to know where am I from. Mm. I mean, that show on SBS is just extraordinary and very. It's emotional to see people explore parts of themselves that they didn't know mm. were there because of their great grandparents. Do you identify qualities in yourself that you perhaps maybe have, you know, through the generations? Yes, have oh, revisited? definitely qua qualities that I see in myself just through um, the many. So my dad was one of thirty-two brothers and sisters, and he, um, just by virtue of that number of people in the family, um, had a lot of external influence from his siblings. Um, my grandparents. Um, grew up in China and then they moved to Hong Kong and I I knew my grandmother even though she couldn't uh, and I had a, a relationship with her my my dad's mum so my paternal grandmother um, and she couldn't speak English and I can't speak Chinese but we had a bond and a connection and I really did feel a deep um, connection to my Chinese side of the family, probably also because I spent a lot of time in Hong Kong when I was growing up. Mm. And uh, would you say you have a food, like heritage? Do you, you say, you, you you know, just connecting it with what we were talking about with um, Alice, you say you can make dumplings, but does that sort of, do you have memories of being in the kitchen I, yourself? I have memories. It's, it's, it's an unusual memory, but I suppose my memory of being in the kitchen as a child in Hong Kong when I'd be staying with my beautiful Auntie Teresa. Auntie Teresa um, grew up during the Second World War, during the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong, and I write a lot about my dad and her and, and their siblings' upbringings during the occupation. And for three years and eight months, Japan occupied Hong Kong. The schools were all shut, and a lot of the girls and women were locked away in their own form of isolation so that the Japanese soldiers couldn't reach them. And my auntie um, grew up in that environment and she went on later in life, she was a very driven person, she went on to become the world's first Chinese air hostess for British Airways. And through that, she built up the family's wealth again. The family's factories had been burned by the Japanese and the businesses, business had been destroyed during the war, but she built up the wealth again to pay for her siblings to go to school. And 
by virtue of her status um, at that time as, a, as an air hostess, she, um, and it's very common in Hong Kong and many countries around the world, she had a maid. And her maid, Bridget, was part of the family and part of my upbringing. And Bridget was always in the kitchen cooking. See, I'm coming around yes, to the cooking. Yes, I've got it. <laughs> and so Bridget would be in the kitchen cooking and I would come into the kitchen as a little girl and I would want to cook. I would want to participate in this ritual of cooking and these five courses that Bridget would bring out for our meal. But because of her station in life and because of this hierarchy um, that existed, Bridget would shoo me out of the kitchen and say, no, no, this isn't for you. Mm. You know, you're not meant to cook. So that was another message that I received when I was very young around cooking. Mm. Um, you know, it was one of many messages. I also grew up in a British household um, it was a very, you know, you've read my story, mm. so you understand that it was a very um, kind of fractured childhood in terms of the different households that I grew up in. So in the British household that I grew up in, my grandmother did cook, but it was seen as a service to the family. So the rest of the family members weren't really invited to join in or to cook as well. It was her service to the family. So it's interesting. So a bit like your background, I didn't really have that um, inculcation in any cooking tradition in my family other than to watch as a an observer. Mm. A, a lot of it too is related, I think, to the roles that our parents played and what, what they were able to provide for us. And I know a lot of your story is around your mum's mental health and her mental illness. Um, so it's it's a very common it's a common thing for people to grow up with parents who are not well. Mm. Uh, I think it's really relatable and really a powerful part of your story. I'm interested to know. I mean, it has a huge impact that kind of upbringing. Um, what do you see that that impact has been for you? Uh, well, it's been massive. I mean, my mum is a she she was a undiagnosed chronic and acute schizophrenic for my entire life. So I think that the onset of the um, the illness or the symptoms of schizophrenia were with her from when she was 16, which I think is not uncommon. Often these things play out during teenage years. And she was misdiagnosed and then undiagnosed for the majority of her life. So that had a huge impact on me growing up because one, we didn't have a name for what she was experiencing in terms of the delusions and in ter terms of the um, suicidal ideation and the suicide attempts. But two, she wasn't being treated. Mm. So, and um, for a short period where she was being treated with electric shock therapy and, uh, and, the, and the drugs that she was being prescribed, they were not for schizophrenia, they were for bipolar or manic depression as it was called. And um, so, yeah, my childhood was really, um, it was really difficult, I suppose, for lack of a better way of describing it. And it was only once I was a parent myself. So as you mentioned before, I've got four children. And when my first, after my first son was born, my grandmother, who essentially was looking, my grandfather had passed away. My grandmother was looking after my mum in WA, I had run away to Melbourne, Victoria to pursue my career. I started a family here. I was still very close to my family, but from a distance. So geographically, I was, I was separate. And when my grandmother passed away, I'm my mum's only child. The responsibility for caring for my mum fell to me. And I had always promised, I mean, this is another thing about messaging as a child. I'd always promised as a child to my grandparents um, and they, you know, for better or for worse, and they had the best intentions, they did always say to me from a very young age, um, you know, please look after your mother when we go. And so I always said, yes, of course I will. Mm. And so I just knew, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, when my grandmother passed away, that my mum would come and live with me and with my husband. And as I mentioned, John and I have been together for 30 years and you can imagine what a big deal that mm. is for a partner to take on their parent-in-law who um, they've never lived with before and all of a sudden somebody who is chronically mentally ill is coming to live with you and your one child at the time. So my mum came to live with us and very quickly 
I knew, and it was very obvious, plain to see, that um, we could not leave her undiagnosed and untreated because her symptoms were so severe. And um, her delusions, you know, she was locking herself in her room, she was threatening to kill herself, and it was actually, um, yeah, it was very traumatic. And for me and for my husband, and I had a little one, and I think because I was a mother at that point, everything changed for me because I thought I cannot let my children or my child, uh, I was actually pregnant with our second second child at the time, I cannot let my children um, grow up with my mum as ill as she was when I was growing up. And so I, um, it was very difficult to um, get help, but I did. And, and once I knew the right way to get help and I had um, I was very fortunate because of my journalism background, 20 years, you know, as a journalist and a newsreader, I actually um, had become family friends with Professor Alan Fells, who was on the board of the Alfred Hospital. And it wasn't that he pulled any strings for me, but what he did was he sat me down and he has a, um, a daughter who uh, um, lives with schizophrenia as well. He sat me down and he held my hands and he said, you know, I will help you. This is what you need to do. And he basically just... Um, you know, like Alice is empowering us to step into the kitchen, Alan empowered me to just pick up the phone and call the cat team. Mm. And that changed my life and my mum's life more to the point. I mean, a woman who had lived until she was, you know, 50 years old with this terrible affliction and these awful experiences um, was suddenly able to walk down a street without mm. hearing voices. Mm. It just breaks your heart to imagine how many people don't get the help they need because for so long there was no language, there was no acceptance, there was, you know, sweeping it under the carpet. It just you'd think how many people have been in pain for so long with no help. Exactly, and I feel so privileged to have been able to seek that help and to be in a first world situation where we actually have mental health facilities mm albeit, you know, lacking to some degree. And obviously there needs to be more support in that area for people. But I'm so lucky. And as you say, there are so many people who fall through the cracks. You look at our, you know, part of our homeless population. Yes. And you look at families that are being torn apart by mm. mental illness. There's still a stigma that exists. And there's still, um, you know, that hesitancy to reach out for help in a lot of families. And I am quite... Um, interested, I suppose, you know, when you bring up my experience growing up with a parent with a mental illness, you think of all of those children yeah. who are being affected and growing up in households where a parent has a mental illness and they're not being adequately supported. Yes. I mean, that's, that is where this idea of intergenerational trauma, I think, comes into play. And that's something that um, I don't think that there is any family that is immune or has been immune to that because every family intergenerationally has lived through war, has lived through migration, has lived through some sort of persecution depending on how far back in a family's history you go. And so I, I think that it's really, and, and again, to, coming back to your first question about do I relate to my family, do I identify with you know, generations ago, well, yes, I do, because I recognise how interconnected that um, timeline of life is and that we are not just um, individuals who just exist out of nowhere. Mm. It's a beautiful book. Do check it out, House of Choir. Um, there's so much in it and you will find out why Mimi's father sues her. <laughs> you go, <laughs> yes, we didn't, it's even, a great we didn't even really talk about we that. We didn't get yes. to that. No, but you got to read the book. It's amazing. Um, and also, in a little while, we're going to dive into very quickly um, your experience in the media. Mm. We'll get down that path. But first, uh, well, a little message, and then we'll get to our next guest, Dr. Lillian Najard. With my respiratory issues, I know I have to quit smoking. And quitting before I'm 40 means I'll live up to nine years longer. What will your future hold when you quit? Make your next quit attempt at Chemist Warehouse. Broad Radio, talking info we love, info we need, and sharing more of us. Watch and listen live every Tuesday, 9am, Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time at broadradio.com.au. 
or find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and LinkedIn at Broad Radio Oz. Talk to us live. Call on 1300 8 Broad. Catch up on demand anytime, anywhere, every time, everywhere. On the train, we'll be here. 2 a.m. existential crisis, <laughs> we've got you covered. Broad Radio, here for more. So, Mimi, you know I'm a big believer of finding whatever techniques and strategies help you that you can put in a little toolkit of life to get through because life is, you know, a struggle, right? But this is one that I have not come across before. It's about helping you with your worries in a strategy where you are making time like worry time okay this is a whole new for me and I have done a lot of therapy in my time I'm not, I'm not boasting the, I think between the two of us not that it's a therapy competition <laughs> but I feel like we've done a lot of therapy that's between right. us and to have never heard about worry time amazing that's something. but we're very evolved because of it obviously you mm. and I uh, the new app is called contain your brain and it is uh created by clinical psychologist Dr Lillian Najard who joins us now hi there Lillian Hi, everyone. How are you? You're joining us from your COVID bed, so I do appreciate that. Although we're probably, <laughs> I mean, the most interesting thing to happen to you since you've been ISO, in ISO for five days. That's true. This is like, you know, the bright spark of my time in my room. <laughs> so thank you for giving me this opportunity. Tell us before about we start, I just wanted to say that um, Mimi, uh, I've worked in public mental health for many, many years, and I really think that you're your book is so important. Your story is, is such an important one to tell because it is um, not an uncommon one. And it is really hard when you see people, you know, who have been suffering for so long when there is treatment available. So I hope that your book encourages more people to, to get help and to make those really challenging phone calls sometimes to make to Thank get the you. support. Yeah, I hope so too. I think what you say about it, it's not an uncommon story is so true because so many people have this similar story, but not everybody has the opportunity to write it down. So having it there in yeah. words, you know, on the page, hopefully can reach some people to get help too. Mm. I can't wait to read it myself. Lillian, tell us about Contain Your Brain. It's uh, a beautiful app. It looks amazing. But tell us, what. how does it work? Okay, so Contain Your Brain is basically a psychological strategy that I've been recommending to my clients for years with anxiety and worry. And like you said before, it's often referred to as worry time. And it's a strategy that basically helps you create boundaries for your worries. So instead of letting them take over every minute of the day, you set a time and a place to worry and only worry in that time and it's really about, you know, not telling yourself to stop worrying because we know that that doesn't work. And I'm, I'm sure um, Joe or Mimi, like uh, it's a very common experience to, to try to get yourself to just stop thinking something. But what ends up happening is your stubborn brain just wants to say, hey, pay attention. This is important and make sure you keep thinking about this. But if you tell your brain thanks for alerting me to this problem and I'll note it down and worry about it at 5 p.m. on Monday. Um, your brain doesn't actually need to bother you about it anymore because it knows that you've taken it seriously. So it's essentially like a strategy that helps you contain your worry to hopefully less than 30 minutes a day and to one particular time and place. And so, so once you write it down, it's like getting it off your mind. Yeah, it's like, so yeah, basically you set your time and place first. Um, often people like to set more of an evening time, but not too close to bedtime. So around between 5 and 7 p.m. is a good time. And it's recommended for it to be about a half hour long, but you can vary that according to what you need, and what's, what's helpful for you. And then, of course, worries are going to pop up during the day, you know, outside of your worry time. So all you do is you add those in and we created the app. And I say we, because I have a co-founder named Brenton as well, um, who designed it and made it look beautiful. Uh, we created the app to make it easier to do this strategy because I one day was talking to one of my clients about doing this worry time or contain your brain strategy. And I just 
realize that uh, the old school method of doing it is so cumbersome because it involved you having like little pieces of paper or note cards and a pen at, um, on hand so that you could write them down and then have a container to put them in. Whereas wouldn't an app be so much easier because people always have their phone. So you just add in your worries and then you just remind yourself, you'll, you'll worry about that in your worry time. And then in your worry time, we actually extend the strategy a little bit further by helping people address their worries effectively. So we get people to sort their worries into one of three categories. So the first one is solvable. So obviously the ones that are solvable, um, we give you some tips to help you find solutions for those issues. And then the second category is the unsolvable. And I think that a lot of our worries can sometimes fall into this unsolvable category and so we help you with tips on how to accept that your worries are sometimes unsolvable and sometimes you're not in control of um, everything. And sometimes all you can do is take care of yourself, be self-compassionate, be kind to yourself, and maybe do uh, strategies that can help you through it, like mindfulness or even distraction sometimes. And then the third category is solved because often when you get to your worry time, either your worries have actually solved themselves by the time you, but by the time you get to worry time or they actually never happen. So in fact, the research shows that up to 90% of what we worry about actually doesn't ever happen. Mm. So we're, we're spending a lot of our time worrying about things that we really just don't need to be expending our mind energy on and so we give people like tips on how to reflect on those types of worries so that when and that whole process and the practice of that will eventually help you in the moment because if you have that type of worry in the moment you'll recognize that oh this is going to be one of those solved ones you know or this is this is one of those unsolvable ones that you know i'm gonna just need to accept or I'm going to need to find a way to cope with because spending time worrying about it actually isn't helping me. I love, firstly, the premise that obviously we are going to worry. You can't not. That's who we are. Although I do like to, I wonder why. Why do we worry? <laughs> well, that's a great question. I think that a lot of people that come in to see me uh, as a psychologist is uh, they want to get rid of anxiety and they want to get rid of worry. They're like, why can't I just get rid of it? And I mean, they're connected. So worry is kind of your, your thought expression of anxiety. And it's there to alert you, just like anxiety is necessary for you to survive. Your worries are there to help you by alerting you to potential problems so that you can solve them. It's just, it, so it has this really useful function, but of course, everything that's functional can be dysfunctional as well. So. If we're worrying too much, too frequently, we're worrying about things that we can't do anything about. It's taking up a lot of time in our day. It's causing us stress and we can't sleep and it's causing us muscle tension and, you know, relationship issues then, uh, you know, or it's causing us to over prepare all the time um, or procrastinate or avoid. Then, then that's when it's time to, to do something about it and contain your brain is a good start. So how do you draw a line under that time? If you've set aside half an hour to worry, but you've got yeah. an hour's worth of worries, <laughs> <laughs> where does it end? I manage that? <laughs> I'm not done well, worrying. Yeah, yet. Okay. So I, I think you can start, if you really think that half hours ain't gonna be enough to start with, you start with an hour. Uh, and see how that goes. But I think your question is a good one. You don't want to go over that time. So uh, my suggestion is to have a plan for that after, afterwards. So um, for instance, you might say um, you're going for a walk. You know, if your worry time's from five to six, then you plan from six to 6.15 or 6.30 to go for a walk or, 6 to 6.30 might be where you um, check out Alice's cookbook and you go cook something nice. Mm. Um, but just have like a concrete activity um, 
for yourself to do so that you have this kind of finite time. So would the ideal, sorry to interrupt, would the ideal then be to get to a point where you're able to let go even though you've got outstanding worries to let go at the end of your allocated time and not worry again until the next allocated time the next day? So you probably, so it's unrealistic unrealistic to say you won't worry again. It's just about noting the worries as they happen and knowing that you have set aside time to actually spend on finding solutions or accepting or reflecting on those worries. So um, generally we try to get people to start with to have a worry time that's every day at a consistent time and in one particular place because that will develop kind of a new mind habit and routine for you. And so it'll be easier and easier to stick to that time. And also you have that kind of reassurance that you've got another time the next day for anything that's left over. Mm. What's really great too, though, is that you are um, setting aside the focus on yourself and not just ingesting all of this, uh, you know, the churning that we all carry with us every day and then pushing through and staying on that sort of that ridiculous conveyor belt of life, which means that you don't ever, you know, we hear about self-care all the time and I was going, well, you know, self-care sounds like a great idea but who's got time for it, right? But, but that's the thing though. That but is that's the, the point. You're actually honouring it and saying, no, this has to happen daily. Yeah, I think a lot of, you know, our instinct when we feel anxious or worried is to try to avoid and to try to squash it. But the research shows that when you try to like suppress your thoughts, it doesn't work, first of all. But secondly, it can actually cause you to start obsessing over those thoughts even more in the future. So it's counterproductive um, to let your worries kind of run you know through and let your worries kind of take over your life but it's also counterproductive to try to squash them and suppress them and stop them so this is kind of a way where you have you get to set the healthy boundaries around your worries and process them in an effective and efficient way Mm. and also it's it's uh Um, working on the premise that I know that you and I would agree with on this, Mimi, that we are not our thoughts. Right. We're not Mm. our thoughts. Thoughts are just thoughts. I think Mm. that a a lot of time we are um, attaching a lot of meaning and power to our thoughts that, um, that make them seem like they're important. And often they're not. And so... It's another, this is just another way of just showing you that, you know, if you, if you actually delay your thoughts, it most of the time, nothing is going to happen. And in fact, the research shows that even if things, even if your worries do happen, people actually uh, realize that they cope better than they thought they would, and they've actually learned something from the experience. So even for the stuff that does happen, it doesn't turn out as badly as what our minds can sometimes let us think. Oh, our minds are very creative. I mean, they just <laughs> run, they're just so powerful in painting a disaster and a catastrophe that mm. honestly. <laughs> well, is yes, this another they... way, is this another way of exercising mindfulness? Absolutely. I think that that's one of the reasons why it's such a powerful strategy, because in order to add your worries throughout the day, you have to be mindful of them. Mm. So it's it's not avoiding worries, which is what we often want to do, but is counterproductive. It's actually like, hold on. Oh, I'm thinking this. I'm going to note that down. And the more and more you do that, the more you understand how you think, the more self-aware you are. And the less uncertain and scary things we'll see. Sitting with your uncomfortable truth. <laughs> it is, isn't yes. it? It's just sitting with it, leaning into it, feeling the discomfort. Yes. <laughs> and but, then worrying about it yes. later. Absolutely. I think tolerating kind of discomfort and distress is often the key to a lot of issues that people have. Mm. It is my response whenever my daughter, who's 13, she's, you know, at 
prime catastrophe age, everything's a drama, right? And so a lot of the time she'll say, Mum, we've got to work this out. And I'll go, we've got, we'll think about that later. That's my my <laughs> one of my most common responses to her because she everything has to be sort of solved now. And I'm like, are you talking about something that's going to happen in 2023? We'll think mm. about that later. <laughs> and most of the time she's forgotten what on earth was the high drama. Um, however, Christmas is just around the corner, Lillian, and I can't let you go without acknowledging that this time of year, whether it's Christmas or whatever you celebrate, it's a, it's a time of family gathering, which brings a lot of worry for a lot of people. A bit of stress. Oh, is that an understatement? Huge amounts for some people and real anxiety. Actually, anxiety and sometimes, you know, you could tip over to trauma. Um, what 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 little nugget have you got for us to get through this time of year? Oh, look, I definitely agree. I think in Australia, especially because it's also the end of the school year. So parents are, you know, up in arms trying to like go to all the end of school events and try to get everything ready for the holidays. Um, and probably 20% of us feel really high levels of stress over the holidays with like financial worries and too much, too much to do and too little time and work and family pressures and all that sort of stuff topping the stress list. So I think the first thing that we can do is really validate ourselves um, instead of judging ourselves. It, it, it's okay to feel down and it's a, it, it makes sense to feel stressed during a time where there's so much going on. And it just makes things worse if you're judging yourself for it. And if you give yourself permission to feel the way that you feel, you often find that it gives you room to make choices that make you feel good about yourself or, or the help you comfort yourself during this time if it's a real struggle. The other thing that I think can be really helpful is that, you know, if you know that the holidays are always a struggle for you, then plan ahead, kind of expect it to be a challenging time and, and be realistic about what you can and can't do and make sure that you communicate this to others. Because if, if you don't know your boundaries and limits, then others won't either. And, um, you know, there's lots of shortcuts to getting things done these days, order online, buy presents that are already gift wrapped, get your groceries delivered, you know, organize like secret Santa instead of having to buy everyone an individual gift. There's a, a few different things that we can do to, to make it a little bit less stressful. And, and very importantly, like have a support system in place. So have a plan, um, especially if you get really low or depressed. Um, that you know, have a plan that includes important phone numbers of your supports or crisis services if that's what you're going to need um, or potentially need and, and maybe have also like a step-by-step -step process to follow if your mood goes beyond the blues or beyond stressed to more of a severe emotional downturn. Um, and if you find it really difficult to get out of bed or take care of yourself or you find that you're using substances more to cope um, or if you have any you know suicidal ideation then these are serious signs of depression that require immediate attention so please there's help out there so please call those services your local hospital um, lifeline is always there for you as well uh, and make sure that you're using the supports that are available to you mm -hmm. and then finally I'd say just do what you can to lift your spirits, um, do things that improve your mood and they don't have to be holiday related. They can just be the things that you normally do throughout the year that make you feel good. So having a good laugh and being kind to yourself and others and you know, treating yourself. Because it's not just that it can be busy around this time of year, it can also be a time of great loneliness yes. for a lot of people. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Well, like, you know, watching other people experience joy can make people feel really mm. alone. And also a lot of people have lost loved ones and that can be a really difficult time um, for people who, who are going through that, you know, in times of celebration. Yeah. I, I uh, a few years ago, I trained myself to just take everything a lot slower. I feel like there's a real pace to Christmas and you feel like you have to rush around the shops and you have to rush to do this and you have to cook this and you have to see this and you know all of that. And I realized when I was doing that, I was shutting myself off to the people that I was connecting with and wasn't aware of those who might be lonely or those who might be struggling. And so I just really thought, okay, you know, I'm gonna slow right down 
which means that I can be mm. a little bit kinder to myself and I can maybe hear when other people need a bit of a helping hand. You know, it's that connection to others, their mm. energy. And it just really has made Christmas so much easier for me and I hope made me a little kinder around other people as well. I yeah, think I'm sure. that's and then you look around and you think, why is everything so calm? What's <laughs> about to go wrong? And then you get the worry app and you write that down and you set a time I love it. for, for Boxing great. Day to worry about yeah, it. Boxing Day is good worry time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Lillian. It's been great to learn all about worry time. I, I love it. It's fantastic. It's been great to be here. Thank you so much for having me and happy holidays. And if it's not happy, that's okay too. Yeah. Thanks so much, Lily. <laughs> Thank Take you. Care. Bye, guys. Now, Mimi, we are going to go over time, but I have to just very quickly before we wrap up, have to first um, acknowledge, of course, that you had a huge career in the media long before you wrote this book. So you TV presenter, you were on A Current Affair for a long time, ABC News. A long career, maybe not a huge one, but a long one. <laughs> <laughs> Same diff. Um, and so because of that, you know, we've seen so many women, amazing women this year, leave the media. We've seen recently Tracy Grimshaw, Lisa Wilkinson, um, Carrie, Carrie um, Bigmore, and of course Lee Sales. That's just four of those women. And I always feel like those women are not necessarily replaced with new women. Mm. And representation is so important in our media. It's like this shuffleboard, but there's no new women. They just get sort of replaced with someone else who was mm. already there. So what's your perspective on well, What's happening with our media landscape? Yeah, I think, um, you know, and looking at the University of Sydney's recent study about just that topic, it's so interesting because, as you say, people aren't being replaced and um, a reshuffle can go on. But really from the top down, the the top positions, the executive positions and also the um, more visible on-air positions are still very heavily per head of the population overrepresented by white Anglo mm. people. And that is so interesting to me because when I started in the industry 20 plus years ago and I started at first at the ABC and then when I went to Channel 9, my old boss there on my first day, he said, you're the first non-bloody wasp that I've ever put on television and don't get any fatter in the face. <laughs> so that was my first day of commercial television. But the reason I tell that story is because I thought at the time, wow, I'm so lucky to be here. I'm so grateful, which I, you know, I was very grateful to be there. I was very lucky to be there. But I thought that I was really at the, you know, at the pointy end of change. Like I thought that I was, you know, I'd, I'd broken this glass ceiling. I was the first, um, you know, non-Caucasian person to be on Channel 9. Um, and not a lot has changed. Nothing has changed. <laughs> so, and that was 20-something years ago. So I was really actually viscerally so pumped and so excited because I thought, wow, I am really at the forefront of this change. And, yeah, I haven't really seen a lot follow through. However, I must say that I think Channel 9 did rank well in terms of its um, diversity, but um, not well enough I suppose mm, yeah. it's you know it's sort of a scorecard that was given to networks and and of course um, SBS um, has been you know consistently the front runner and the ABC but it's about as you say um, not only replacing um, women or um, women of color or you know any sort of diversity that we're talking about um, you know, ability diversity as well, gender diversity, cultural diversity, the list goes on, age diversity, mm. everything. It's not just about replacing that person that is in that very visible role. It's about bringing more people in who can relate to that type of diversity. Absolutely. And the, we're referring to the uh, report, Who Gets to Tell Australian Stories, that Media Diversity Australia did with the University of New South Wales. Yes. Me. Yeah. Um, What's really amazing about it is that it, it demonstrates that, as you say, nothing has changed. Australia's non-European population is at least 19 times greater than the representation on commercial networks, which is a ridiculous statistic when the actual title of this study, Who Gets to Tell Australian Stories, 
highlight that when we have this lack of diversity, Australia is just not reflected. The stories mm. that are told doesn't reflect our population. And the media, just by virtue of being the media, is the mantra of the media really is to be a mirror to society. And I don't think in Australia it has lived up to that mm. ever in my living memory. Um, even when I was a little girl, you know, growing up in Scarborough and Western Australia, I remember having a little black and white TV set in my bedroom and I would watch um, television till all the hours of the night and I watched a lot of news and current affairs and I saw this woman called Yarn Event mm. that we all, you know, grew up with and, and loved and she was the first... Um, non-blonde woman that I'd ever seen on television and she was sort of the only woman that I had seen in such a high-ranking role and again it's taken a very long time for women to um, step into roles of influence in TV and again we, we should talk about how important it is because I think people think oh we're just ticking a box and um, it's it's just uh, making sure that we have quotas and numbers. But I think those things are really important because if you can't see it, you can't be mm, it. Mm. And and if you don't have that visibility, then those children like me watching TV when I was a little girl are thinking, well, that's not possible for me, those leadership roles yes. or that yeah. visibility. Well, and as you say, so the media is intended to be a mirror for society, but it works the other way. It inf influences society and it shapes behaviours and attitudes. Yes. So, it's absolutely critical. Um, and uh, so here we are, Broad Radio, trying to make a difference, of course. <laughs> exactly. That's what I always say. I bring it back exactly. to us. You That's... should be on this list in this study and you'd have all the ticks. Oh, well, you know, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, Mimi, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. I've really loved it. And do read the book. I loved it. It's so great. And thank I'm you. happy that Pleasure. I made time in my life to read it. I'm so grateful <laughs> that you did. It is amazing that you had the time. Thank you. Oh, look, it was it was an absolute joy. Um, thank you so much to everybody who joined us uh, on listening today on Facebook and YouTube. Um, particularly would like to say hello to Donna, who say more people are tuning, turning to independent media like Broad Radio for a reason. Thanks, Yay. Donna. Um, and Michelle again, she just says she's sick of being dictated to by the Murdoch white men. So tune into Alternatives Like Broad Radio. This is turning into a love fest. I love it. Um, but it's uh, really true that we are seeking, I think, alternative ways to get um, our stories and to really kind of connect with each other in our community. That's mm -hmm. what it is. It's about connecting with each other. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Mimi. And Thank we'll you. be back with more Broad Radio next Tuesday. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Like you tell pretty lies at 5 a.m.